England's villages. Thatched cottages, neatly tended gardens, the village shop, the church, tea on the lawn. It's a cosy chocolate box image recognised across the globe. I'm Ben Robinson, and as an archaeologist, I'm fascinated by the places where we live and how they've evolved from ancient times to the present day. For me, the story of the village isn't about sleepy rural idylls. It's one of purpose, persistence and power. And here we'll see who had that power in this secluded valley in the middle of Dorset. Milton Abbas is an 18th century masterpiece, picture perfect, but hiding darker secrets. It wouldn't be here at all were it not for a social divide that gave the rich almost unfettered power over the lives of the poor. Power which allowed the landowner to wipe out an entire community in the name of fashion, self-image and control. The first thing you notice about the main street in Milton Abbas is the regularity of the houses, all built at the same time in the late 1700s. They suggest order and a neatness typical of genteel Georgian architecture. That's because Milton Abbas was built as part of a much bigger plan designed to boost the image and power of one man. To find out why, we need to go about a mile over there and go back to a time before this village existed. This is Milton Abbey, founded in 934 AD by King Athelstan. This is part of the medieval monastery, the 15th century Abbot's Hall. The rest is an 18th century extension, and what an extension. Designed by Sir William Chambers, it's in the Gothic Revival style. Ornate stonework and arches pointing to the sky mimic fine medieval architecture. This grand mansion and spectacular abbey church stand alone in the landscape. This is no accident. It's all down to a wealthy landowner called Joseph Damer, who in 1752 made this country estate in Dorset his home. Now taking the title Lord Milton, Damer set about turning his imposing home into a fashionable rural retreat to show off to his wealthy visitors. Even King George III came to stay. As a country landowner, he also had to run a farm, but creating a showpiece was his main concern. From the top of the Abbey Church Tower, you get an idea of the scale of his grand design. And to make it a reality, there was only one man with the right credentials. The father of landscape design, Lancelot Capability Brown. And the canvas he's working on is absolutely vast. This is a massive, expansive landscape. In 1763, Brown began creating this spectacular park all around the Abbey. By this time, Brown had already designed the landscape grounds at Blenheim Palace, Longleat, and 700 acres at Petworth in West Sussex. Out went Italian-style formal planting. In came wide, open, naturalistic parkland, with any unsightly blemishes physically removed. There was one blot on this landscape, the ancient sprawling town of Middleton, just down there. Middleton would have been a typical town of the time, noisy, bustling, smelly, full of the great unwashed, as Lord Milton might have thought. Worst of all, it was right by his back door. It had to go. 
I think I'm standing just where a house stood before it was cleared by Lord Milton. One resident refused to move, a lawyer in the old town called Mr. Harrison, who took Lord Milton to court and won. But the law was no match for wealth and power. An ornamental lake had always been part of Capability Brown's design. So Lord Milton simply flooded what was left of the old town, forcing Mr. Harrison out. Kate Feelish is a writer and landscape gardener specialising in the Georgian era. I suspect of all the lakes that were created by Cape Blitz Brown in landscapes up and down the country, this is probably the most artificial, took the most effort. I mean, taking away an entire town, uh, I think that's pretty unique. I mean, it's certainly stunning. It's like being part of a picture, isn't it? I mean, it's like being actually part of the action. It was a standard entertainment for house guests in the country house in the 18th century. And you would go out on a lake like this. It might be in a big boat, it might be in a small boat, slightly depended on the size of the lake. Um, some people had scaled down men of war. Other people would just enjoy rowing, quietly rowing on the lake. Part of what it was all about was recreating these paintings that these um, young men, these milordi, had brought back from Italy from their grand tour, which was a bit like a posh gap year. They had these fabulous 17th century paintings of the Roman countryside with little temples and maybe a river or a lake, and that was one of the things that they wanted to create. So lakes like this were highly desirable, envied, and presumably much copied. Well, the whole English landscape garden was copied up and down the country, but it was copied beyond that, everywhere from, from Russia through to the fledgling United States of America. And in France, it was known as Le Jardin Anglais, and even Marie Antoinette wanted one. With the old town removed, in 1773, Lord Milton created the new village of Milton Abbas, a sanitised and smaller village designed by Capability Brown to house the farm workers and craftsmen that Lord Milton needed to look after his country estate. A showpiece to impress aristocratic visitors, but in a valley conveniently hidden from Lord Milton's view.